Okay, so to continue this uh, story on the particle orbit, um, let's go back to this transparency and, and review a little bit what we're doing here. So what we're saying is that a particle is gyrating around a field line, but in addition, it's moving along a field line. At, so it's just uniform translation along a field line, and it's just this gyro motion along a field line. So what's the, the net particle orbit look like then? Well, it's going to be a helix, basically. Net single particle orbit, I should say again. And so we'll go back and uh, draw, you know, here's a uniform magnetic field. Um, and the idea is that what's actually happening to the particle is it's, its guiding center, remember the center of this little uh, circle, so to speak, is gyrating around and it just keeps moving along the field line. So eh, this is always difficult to get the arrows right. <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, so the, the idea is that it's gyrating and moving along a field line. So it's moving in this direction. Its guiding center is moving this direction with a, a V parallel uh, motion or velocity. And uh, in addition, it's gyrating around the field line and the distance it is away is equal to rho, which is this gyro radius, and that is in turn v perp over omega sub c. And notice that each particle might have a different v perp. I might have a Maxwellian distribution of particles, something like that. And uh, so I might have quite a distribution of function of particles, okay? And so each particle will have its own v perp. Each particle will have its own gyro radius. And sort of typical numbers here for laboratory plasmas with one Tesla 500 eV would be of the order of a few um, hundredths of a, uh, or a few cent tenths of a centimeter, uh, smaller than a centimeter. So that's pretty small orbits, but it's pretty fast motion also. This is for ions. For electrons, it's a factor of 40 smaller you know, 0 0.01 centimeters or smaller. So it's, you know, I can't even draw it. It's the width of that line, basically, <laughs> here on the page. Well, the electrons, uh, it depends on the V. And the direction of motion along the field line depends upon V. It can be V. I didn't have any electric field in this problem. We had electric field not equal to zero, B field. I'm sorry, electric field equal to zero. <laughs> E equals zero, B not zero is what we're doing, working on at the moment. <laughs> okay, so uh, for this case, there's no reason the particle couldn't be moving this direction or that direction for either electrons or ions. But there is a sense of rotation here, which is unique. Uh, ions rotating in a left-handed relative to the left-handed sense relative to the magnetic field, electrons rotating in a right-handed sense. Now, um, there's a sense here of a, a something which is called a pitch angle, which we'll come back to. Um, imagine, you know, if V parallel was much greater than V perp, I'd be moving mostly along field lines and only a little bit perpendicular, okay? Whereas if I was moving mostly perp, I'd have a very tight helix and I'd hardly be moving along at all. So people often call, often define something um, which is called a pitch angle. Okay, so just uh, as a matter of uh, pitch angle. Um, and what that is, is uh, they define the tangent alpha, where alpha is going to be the pitch angle, is V perp over V parallel. And, and then you can write, of course, that alpha is equal to the arc tangent, tan minus 1, of V perp over V parallel, and therefore... Uh, sine alpha is equal to V perp over V, and cosine alpha is equal to V parallel over V. Now, some sort of extremes of interest are if we have V, perp v parallel equals zero, then we would have only gyro motion, okay? And that would be V parallel equals zero alpha. That would turn out to be alpha equals zero, de uh, sorry, uh, 90 degrees. Right, got to get the angles right here. Uh, that's a 90-degree pitch angle, 
And that would actually be then perpendicular to the magnetic field B. Okay. On the other hand, if I had V perp is equal to zero, then the particle would be moving purely perpendicular. And that would be V perp equals zero, sine alpha equals zero, alpha equals zero. So that would be alpha equals zero degrees, and that would be parallel to B. So often then what we will end up doing is we'll have a V parallel and a V perp, and uh, we'll think of a particle being here, and there's this pitch angle alpha, um, which is then uh, the, where we are in direction. But notice that that is also the pitch of this helix, okay? Because if I have v only V parallel, I'll move straight along field line. I won't even have any gyro motion. Or on the other hand, if I have V parallel equals zero, I'll be purely perpendicular. So this is um, of the velocity V or the helix uh, of, of the orbit. So either way, it's a, it's a um, uh, well, it is the pitch angle, so to speak. Okay, now we need to uh, complete a little bit of our uh, gyro motion stuff here. And um, so what we will end up doing, oh, I'm sorry, I want to come back to this just to say um, that on this, uh, our net particle ob orbit is then uh, parallel translation along the magnetic field and perpendicular we have this gyro motion about B and the net of this uh, gives us this helical motion um, and alternatively we sometimes only speak then of the guiding center motion, which is, if you imagine the center of this, uh, you know, it just sort of moves along here, and so this would be the guiding center motion. Uh, I abbreviated it, sorry. Guiding center. Guiding center of this uh, gyro motion, you know. So uh, that's the, the composite of what we have. Now, the next thing I, I want to do is to go through the Cartesian uh, way of doing the, uh, uh, the gyro motion, just to see how that, uh, so we see the mathematics of how that works. So this is the um, Cartesian coordinates um, for the problem with uh, E equals zero and B not equals zero. So again, only an electric field. And as I said, uh, we have a propensity in plasma physics for always taking the magnetic field in the Z direction. Every field has its convention, and the convention here is that B is always in the Z direction. So therefore, V cross B for the Lorentz force will, equal to, will be equal to uh, V cross a unit vector in the z direction times b. And if we just now work that out, uh, the x component will get a vx uh, y cross z. Um, I'm sorry, x cross z. Uh, well, OK, I want to do it this way. I want to get vy x hat. So we take x uh, direction, x component, vy cross z, uh, and then minus uh, v x in the y hat direction, all in the b. So if we look at our equation then, uh, again our perpendicular equation primarily, we have dv dt is qb over m times uh, v cross b, but now becomes vy x hat minus vx y hat. Uh, and I took the b out in front. And so this becomes omega sub c uh, vy x hat minus vx y hat. Now, the components we're interested in then are the x, y, and z component. So if I take the x hat component, which is to say the 
you know, component of this equation, the x direction, I get dvx dt is equal to omega sub c vy. Okay, that I get a component from there, get nothing from there. Y hat component. Oh, and I can solve this in some sense, kind of a convenient way to do it here, is that vy I can then write as 1 over omega sub c uh, dvx by dt. The y hat component now just gives me dvy by dt is equal to, uh, now for y, y dot x is 0, y dot y is 1. So this is minus uh, omega sub c, again, uh, times uh, vx. And now I can substitute this value of vy into that one. And then the net equation, okay, then becomes 1 over omega sub c d squared vx by dt squared. Uh, and then bringing this over the other side, plus omega sub c vx is equal to 0. And I'm going to put the omega c up, and that's going to become a harmonic oscillator equation in a moment. What about in the z direction? Well, we get dv z by dt. And again, I take z hat dot the right-hand side, and I get 0. Okay, There's nothing in that direction because I'm taking z dot v cross z, z, z hat dot v cross z hat. So now let's look at this equation, and we'll again uh, just uh, multiply through. We'll just multiply through by omega sub c, and then it becomes d squared uh, vx by dt squared plus omega c squared vx is equal to 0. What kind of an equation is that? Good old simple harmonic oscillator equation, right? With what frequency? Well, the oscillation frequency is just the so-called cyclotron frequency. Okay, now, um, so what's the solution of that equation? Um, solution of that harmonic oscillator equation? Well, uh, the solution that I will choose, I mean, there's a, you can choose the constants any way you want, is that Vx of t is in fact some V perp times the sine omega ct. That, that'll get me my oscillation at the cyclotron frequency. And now I need a plus constant of the motion. But I'll choose as my constant of the motion some phase where that phase tangent phi naught is equal to Vx naught over Vy naught. Now, so that is a reasonable solution of that. I have just cleverly, in some sense, chosen the boundary conditions uh, to give me the right solution. Then uh, you can also then calculate Vy of t. You remember from one of our equations was, in fact, 1 over omega sub c uh, dvx by dt. And so uh, you just take its differential, and what you find is that this becomes then uh, v perp um, times the cosine of omega ct plus v naught. Okay. So if I take vx squared plus vy squared, okay, vx squared plus vy squared, that's equal to v perp squared, which is equal to a constant. Okay, actually, in this in this problem, there's no net energy transfer in that direction. If I integrate these over time, then I can get the x position. Okay, and so what you find out of that is that x of t is equal to the guiding center position, which is just the constant of motion minus v perp over omega sub c times the cosine omega c t plus v. And y of t is equal to y guiding center um, plus, it turns out, v perp over omega sub c um, times the sine omega c t plus v naught. Um, 
And now what you can show is that if you take x minus x guiding center and square it, and you add y plus, oops, y minus y guiding center and you square it, then what you will have is x minus x guiding center v purple over mega sub c cosine, square it, you get cosine squared, take away the sine, and then you get the same thing with a sine squared. And so this becomes v perf squared over omega c squared, sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. And this is equal to, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I keep getting down there, yeah. Uh, this is equal to rho squared, gyro radius squared. So that just confirms what we were saying before, that, you know, we have this helix, and the radius of the helix is the gyro radius. And it just oscillates between whether it's in the x direction or it's in the y direction. Now, there's one final thing that we need to mention about this gyro motion, and that's that it, is a, that it produces a so-called magnetic moment. This is, after all, a charge in motion which creates a current. Therefore, that will create a magnetic moment. So let's uh, estimate that. Um, so what we have in mind is that... Um, we are worried about a magnetic moment. Now, so we have a B field, and then we had this a vector omega sub C in the downward direction, and we had the particle uh, gyrating around the field line, uh, and we had it off a distance rho. Um, now, the magnetic moment in magnitude is defined as the current times the area, or some people might call it IA. So how much current does one single particle give me? Well, it's that particle divided by some time which is the cyclotron time. And I forgot to emphasize it earlier, but our frequency was a radian frequency. So in fact, tau sub, t, tau sub c is 2 pi over omega sub c. And so that says our i is in fact q omega sub c over 2 pi. How much is the area of this motion? So this is the current that's you know going around here. How much area is it? Well, it's just pi rho squared, right? Or pi v perp squared. So the magnetic moment that we have is in fact uh, I A, and so it's Q omega C over 2 pi times pi, and this will be pi v perp squared over omega sub C squared. So this is pi v perp squared over omega sub c squared. And the two the pi's cancel out. One of the omega c's cancel. And we get q v perp squared uh, over 2 omega sub c. And now we plug in that omega sub c is q b over m. The q's cancel. And so what we find, the magnetic moment, which is usually defined as mu, is then m v perp squared over 2b. So this is the commonly used uh, magnetic moment uh, throughout this business. And it turns out it's going to be a roughly conserved quantity because it's an action variable, it turns out. We'll sort of come back to that later, an action integral. Namely, it's an integral px dx for this, this cyclic motion around the field line. But we don't need to worry about that for the moment. So this is called the, again, the, I'll put it again down here, magnetic moment. Now, again, because um, these particles are moving around the magnetic field, there's actually, usually people talk about this as only a scalar quantity. Uh, but in fact, it has a direction. And the direction of it is the same direction as 
as this cyclotron motion, it turns out. And basically it's in that direction because what happens is that, the, is that remember this, this motion, if we, count, if we look at the, you know, it creates a current. It's such as to have that current be such as to decrease the magnetic field. It's a diamagnetic effect. So um, magnetic moment. let me put it this way, leads to a diamagnetic effect. And so if we needed it, as we will once or twice, we would have that the magnetic moment vector would then be minus mv perp squared over 2b uh, and in the direction of b. So the idea is, again, it's in the opposite direction to the magnetic field, okay? Uh, because the positive ions are gyrating oppositely is what it amounts to. B is equal to B vector over B. So the, the idea is then uh, is again that uh, currents in their, um, let me say it, due to gyro motion Uh, act to reduce the intensity of the magnetic field, and that is to say that the plasma is diamagnetic. Okay, so uh, it's going to turn out uh, later, okay, as we get into this uh, um, later. Um, derivations and later considerations in inhomogeneous magnetic fields that as long as the magnetic field is reasonably homogeneous over a gyro radius, which is tenths of a centimeter. Like magnets are, you know, meters or meters across or so. So that's a reasonable assumption. And as long as the magnetic field doesn't vary too rapidly compared to the gyro frequency, which was 10 to the 8th per second as a radian frequency for the ions, or if I divide by 2 pi, that becomes actually about 15 megahertz, it turns out. So 15 megahertz is a good thing to think about as the ion cyclotron frequency. It turns out gig, uh, 25, 25 gigahertz is the electron gyro frequency. We didn't put that down, but uh, anyway. And the comment is that uh, as long as the magnetic field doesn't vary too rapidly, then when we get into an inhomogeneous magnetic field configuration, this quantity mu um, will turn out to be a reasonably good constant of the motion because it's an action angle variable. Uh, and, and so it'll be a, uh, an approximate constant of the motion, which we, we will find to be uh, quite useful in our analysis. So we've gone through now the subjects of... Uh, uh, with uh, an electric field only, and uh, you know, we did that, and no B field, and then vice versa with a B field and no electric field. And now we're ready to combine the two and get into E cross B drifts, which are later parts of uh, Chen's chapter two, and, and also to a certain extent, uh, Bittencourt's chapter two. Uh, I'm reminded that I also for, said I was going to say something about cold fusion uh, uh, last time, and I didn't. Uh, the present story seems to be that it's not clear that anybody has cold fusion, which is to say uh, tunneling through the Coulomb barrier. It may be that people actually have hot fusion in a cold environment if you have surface edge effects where you have accelerated uh, 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 fine-scale electric fields around surfaces where you crack surfaces where you might get enough acceleration to actually accelerate some ions to kilovolts and then, and then hence get effectively hot fusion by... Um, by overcoming the Coulomb barrier. But that's uh, still a controversial point, and we'll see how it all works out in years. <laughs>